Today, I don't really know how people cope with the complexities of life. Life is really, really fast. The internet is around, which makes addiction happen far more quickly. Divorce rate is up. Suicide is up. Depression is up. How an 18-year-old handles all of this, I don't really know. And I don't think philosophy has any answers, short-term answers. I think Oscar Wilde was right, that anything of value takes time to be learned. And you can't get it from books. You can't get it in schools. Let me give you this hypothetical. Imagine I'm your father, okay? Now, you didn't choose me as your father. Um, and let's say that because of my intellectual, emotional capacities, I found life to be a little difficult. I also hate my wife, i.e. your mother. We just don't get along. Not knowing how to cope with life, your mom, you, money, my own problems as a human being, I gravitate towards drinking, maybe even drugging. And I come home being violent, angry, abusive, all, you know, all that stuff. But you and I have shared some really, really great moments. You love me, and I love you. But most often I just come home angry because that's just the way things are. Versus him. I'm his dad, never drank, never smoked, and we have a great relationship. Now, this is the injustice of life. You know, it's not your fault, it's not his fault, it's nobody's fault. That's just the way things are. Now, you could, of course, blame me saying, well, you're the, you have the freedom to do ABCD instead of EFGH. I don't think so, but nevertheless. Now, your question is, well, what do you do with this? Do you want to be good in your own relationship? You want to be good with your friends? You want to do good in school? But this is your life. You have to come home, take care of me. You have to go home and take care of your mother. This is no life to be had for an 18-year-old. So what do you do? The alternative is, is very difficult, which is... I mean, there are so many things that you have lost in this process. You have lost your ability to love, to trust, to have faith, stability. There is no GPS in life. You know, you're born in an environment, you look to your father for some guidance, you look to your mother for, your, for some guidance, but they're not there. And you have to figure things out when you're three or four or five or six, and it's just too much. Life is far too complicated for the mind of a five or six, seven-year-old. And now, let's just say, you and I run into one another, you like me, I like you, you have a history, and that history has broken every good thing about you. And now you want to make this relationship work. And I want it to work, but every time I come close, you push me away, and rightly so, because you know that I could potentially become like a father. For example, unless I have the patience of Job in the Old Testament, and Job didn't really have that much patience, but nevertheless, unless I know your history, unless I have this immense love for you, that has made me so incredibly passive to your abuse that you keep pouncing on me and I say it's okay. And I have glimmers of hope that this will eventually work if I can be just a bit more patient. Another day, another week, another month, another year. Whether it will happen or not, I don't really know. But the basic platform is you have to kind of put back together the things that have been broken and shattered. In this day and age where things are moving so fast, where the only person you can trust is your therapist because there's no one around. And the problem with therapists these days is that they need to create the space. You're the patient, they're the therapist, and they can't get too close. Even if they see you in a supermarket, they look the other way. And the truth is that's not the way things work. If you want things to be transformative, you need intimacy. باید گرفتارم شوی تا که گرفتارت شوم از جان و دل یارم شوی تا عاشق زارت شوم من نیستم چون دیگران بازیچه بازیگران اول بدام آرم تو را وانگ خریدارت شوم Let me change this a little bit This may sound a little weird but nevertheless Let's say I walk in the classroom it's the first day of class and you look at me and first you say yuck and then I open my mouth and you say yuck yuck and nothing about me pleases you so you think about dropping claws, but you say, in the past, I've come not to like things, but after spending some time, I grew to like them. Maybe this was the same thing. So you say, let me not drop the class just yet. Let me give it another shot. So you come back to class on Thursday. And for some strange reason, your perception changes a little, not too much, a little. The third class meeting, everything about you changes. And then you send me an email or after class, you say, Amir, can I come and talk to you in the office? I say, sure. And you've never been to my office. It's like Alibaba and the flying rug or flying carpet. I have a few Persian rugs in my office. And if you sit on them, they'll fly. And so uh, 
you kind of feel a little strange, a little weird, but you like it. It's not unpleasant. And then you begin to talk to me about your history. Now, a couple of things need to happen. It's an unresolved set of narratives that you've held within for the past like 20 years. And even as a young woman, you desire to be in relationships, that history always comes in and destroys everything. It's like Satan. And even though you've always been very reserved, very private, all of a sudden, everything just spills over. And you say everything about everything. Now, if I'm not attracted to you, I need to like your story. I need to like your body language. I need to like the tone of your voice. If you come to my office smelling like weed, I probably won't invite you back to the office again. If your language is filled with profanities, I probably won't like you. So you have to have some things about you that are attractive for me as a 60 year old man from a different culture. Now, you leave my office after like 45 minutes of conversation, which of course was monopolized entirely by you. I just nodded my head. You send an email of apology. I'm sorry, I didn't know, I don't really know what happened, but can I bring you a cup of coffee? Just to say thank you, sure. So you come again on Tuesday, uh, I expect that you drop off the coffee and just leave, but no. You know, Westerners are invaders and occupiers. So you come to the office, you sit and occupy my chair and invade my space. Another 45 minutes, and then you talk and talk and talk and talk. And my life for you grows a bit more. And uh, I'm not interested in your story. I'm not interested in your history. As you talk, I say to myself, is there any way I can sell her my story? You're only 20 from a ridiculous culture and background. I come from a bit more serious background. I'm a bit more seasoned than you are. I've been to places that you want to go. So I say, You're addicted to your historical narratives. That's the poison. How do I make you addicted to a different kind of narrative? Now remember what history does. Something goes inside you and it refuses to leave. And as it lives inside you, you give it nourishment, imagination, feelings, thoughts, past, present, future. It blossoms into what we call trauma. So you can get rid of this trauma by simply sitting and talking about it. It doesn't work that way. I have to create a trauma that can compete with this trauma. So I'll have you come to the office again. Then I say, listen, you know, my wife is making this delicious food. Chicken tikka masala, Persian style. You want to come over? So, well, is it appropriate? So, what do you mean? Well, you know, you're my professor, I'm your student. You're just having dinner. You don't want food? You can meet the wife, you can meet the family. My parents will be there. You just come over there. It's okay. Bring your mom if you want. So, you come over the house. And now you think, like, I'm just going to, like, sit and talk, you know, like the classroom. I'm here, like, vacuuming the house, you know, changing diapers. I've been shaved or shower for days. So, oh, it's a regular guy. You know, so, oh, well, let me just play with the kids a little. Have fun. And for the first time, you experience something you have not experienced, I suppose, for a long, long time. An environment in which you feel comfortable. And Persians, with listeners, we are extremely hospitable. Our house is your house. But not really, but let's just say. And then I will intentionally keep feeding you until two in the morning where you're exhausted. Now you live like 45 minutes away. I say, Val, listen, Sarah, give Val that bedroom over there. Let her go and rest there. Sleep in your house? Yeah, it's okay. Comfort, trust, stability. And then you leave. And then of course you say thank you. But the experience doesn't leave you, you know. It becomes memorable a little bit. And then uh, the new week starts and you email me again. Amir, I want to bring over pizza from Zachary's. Deep dish, spinach, mushroom. Okay. Well, you're very clever, you know. You don't do it on a Tuesday because you know I have class on Wednesday. Say, so, Amir, I'll bring pizza on Friday. Is that okay? Now, I know what's going on. You want to bring it on Friday so you can sleep over Saturday and Sunday. You like the experience. So, yeah, sure, why not? And so you're about to leave Saturday. I say, well, listen, you know, you mind helping me in the backyard? Really? Yeah. I'll give you some clothes. And then this happens over and over and over. You spend less time at your place and more time at my place. And every time you want to talk to me or my family about your trauma, 
you bite the tongue. It's not the proper place. And there is something about the environment that consumes you, pushes you into just being there, not your past. And little by little, you think less about the past and more about me and my family and the house and the backyard and the front yard and all that. And at a certain point, I say, so what are you doing with school? What do you think I should do? Why don't you do philosophy? I'll get you a job. Okay. What I say goes now. You have no will. You have no choice. I become your voice. I become your desires. And then after five or six or seven years, you have a brand new addiction. Class, ideas, books. And little by little, you'll start to realize that your trauma was very small. It was about you. These ideas connect you to a bigger world. It's like your trauma is the star, the moon, and the ideas are like the sun. You have a different agenda about yourself in life now. And every time this moon wants to come out, the sun says, no, you're not interested. So that's the only way, at least for me, uh, that's the only way change can come about, replacing one addiction to another. But I should also tell you that while you journey towards this particular addiction towards me and my family, you will abuse me and you will abuse my family because every time you get close, you will step back. And my wife and I know how this stuff works. So we'll say, okay, I won't call her. She'll call when she's ready. Now, there's a good chance that you may never call back. So people who have some broken parts to them, it's very difficult to keep them around for too long unless the addiction is really intense.